last week had hard preaching. Very uh, can be can very convicting uh, when God turns around and says, "You know, you're not getting away with anything. You're not getting away with anything." I, I gotta tell you, uh, I always laugh at that a little bit because uh, we are getting away with something. I'm at the rapture, we're getting away with something. You know? I mean, yeah, God's gonna have us sit down with them and He's gonna talk to us. Uh, you've got to understand something. The judgment, don't be afraid of judgment seat of Christ. It's not a, uh, it's not a whipping post. Okay? I, I know preachers that were preaching that all your unconfessed sin is going to come out of the judgment seat of Christ. I thought Jesus died for that stuff. So. You know what the judgment seat of Christ is? The judgment seat of Christ is an award ceremony. You're going to get the what you did. He's not condemning anybody. Why would he condemn anybody? You're all saved. You know? It's what you earned, you know, and, and you earned whatever he gives you, you earned. If you didn't get anything, oh, well, you didn't earn, be happy for somebody else. Amen? You know, and don't worry, we're at, but the only thing I will warn you is uh, because of, you know, reading in like Isaiah and Jeremiah and, and around this Bible, the one trend I noticed is if God says it, we'll deal with it like this, uh, 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 you, I want you to know of me. Learn of me, he said. Okay? Uh, if you're not learning of him, I guess what you'll be doing during the millennium. Wherever you are right now, that's where you'll start on the other side in the millennium. We're going there to be taught. We're going to be taught this Bible. There's a reason. We haven't met the Father yet. And you're not going to meet him until you're done the millennium and the great white throne. And then he's going to take you up there and, and introduce him. But you have to understand, it's going to take them a thousand years to get you ready. And because, let's face it, we're, we're very stubborn and not heads. Amen? Amen. So, uh, but God says something in Jude, and he, he wanted to show you something. That's uh, He wanted to tell you, hey, man, uh, nobody's getting away with anything. We see it in our world right now. Uh, we got a bunch of politicians that believe they can get away with anything. They're above the law. They can do what they want. Well, I got the DOJ. I got the Justice Department. Don't do what I tell them to do. And uh, that's exactly what's happening. If you really believe they're getting away with all this stuff, uh, God's sitting there, he's taking a book out, and he's got a book and he's writing it all down. Don't think anybody's getting away with anything. You didn't get away with anything, did you? You had to come to him. You had sin, and you had to come to him. He sat there, and, and he, by the day you got saved, he's pointing right there, right there, right there. Anybody here, when you read the Bible before you were saved, what happened? What did it say? Judgment. That's the only message you get. What's that? You better get saved. God has nothing for them if they're not saved. Uh, uh, God's not sitting there trying to tell people that are unsaved to go, go do good things. Why? They're unsaved. He doesn't even know them. Don't expect him to go around, uh, I'm going to chase and uh, I'm going to go spank uh, Joe Biden. It's not his kid. You don't go spanking the kids down the block. Don't worry. God will take care of things. And when he does... Believe me, it won't be a good day for them. Amen? And then imagine, after, or even after that, you had guys that were popes. Believe me, they didn't live no happy life just because they're rich. They're going to stand before God, and he's going he's to start talking to them. What do you think? He's going to talk to them like he talks to some, some uh, person who didn't have everything? These guys had God right in front of their face all the time, and they wished to do it another way and wished to be disobedient. They wished to send people to hell in his name. got a bad day going in front of them. When they get in front of the, when they get in front of the great white throne, they're going to have a bad day. Because that, he's going to bring everything out in front of them. And they're going to see what they did. And then all those people that followed them and wouldn't come to the Lord, and believe me, they've had their chance. Don't think they haven't. They're going to go down with their leader. Amen. Amen. All right, the book of Jude. And what last week, like I said, we got into. He says, in basically, in the first uh, part of this, he has a salutation and he tells you who it's for. And he says, Look, these are for saved people. Those that are sanctified, uh, people who are lost are not sanctified. These are God's people he's going to talk to uh, right here. Uh, don't expect other people to know uh, what you're what this is about because not many, I don't, I, I don't know, I, I think Larry and I, we go around the town, we ask people if they read the Bible if they're unsaved. I don't know anybody that really says yes. You, Larry? 
Unsaved people don't read the Bible. Don't expect them to know any of this stuff. Amen? And uh, he gives a salutation. Then he says something. He says, uh, he, he wants you, gives you a charge in verse number three, and he says something like this. I want you to earnestly contend for the faith. I want you to stand up for it that was once delivered to the saints, those, those guys that uh, led you to Christ, and now you're one of them. He says, I, uh, when I, I put that, I want you to contend for that faith you have. And he, he gives the reasoning in verse number four. He says, for there are certain men. And guess what? They crept in unawares. You didn't even realize it. They crept in. You know, I'll tell you how they crept in. They came from Bible colleges. They have resumes. And what happens is they come in to be the pastor, and everybody says, you have a resume? And they come in and they give a resume. This is no job. This isn't something that you turn around and you, you, you walk in and say, well, I went to school. School doesn't qualify you for the ministry. We've got that concept in our head. Oh, you know, it, it, if you go to school, you're qualified to do these things in the world. How's the world doing? Don't bring it into church, man. It's messed up the world. Why would we want to mess up the church with that stuff? That worldly education, you know what? You know what? I, I have all the alphabet soup people. It's worthless to me. I'd rather have a guy who work with his hands than a guy that, that just sits there and has an opinion all the time. You know? Uh, who did Jesus pick? I mean, who did the Lord pick? Uh, he, didn't, he didn't go down to the sons of the prophets in the schools. He went in the field and picked Elisha. Uh, he, you, when he picks Elijah, what does it say? It just says Elijah did just like... What? It's, his resume isn't a big thing. God doesn't need, need you to be qualified. You'll qualify in the end. How's that? By you just saying, thus stay at the Lord. That's all you need to say when you get up. But you have the only book in the world that says that. What? Thus say at the Lord. Just say what he said. Amen? Just tell people what God said. And uh, he says, I want you to earnestly contend for the faith because these people came out of wars or ungodly men. And uh, and he says something. He says uh, he says they come in and they come in very lustful, lasciviousness. Uh, they change things. Uh, they want you to get your feelings involved. And God's sitting there saying, No, no, this thing needs to be spiritual, not sens sensual. Amen. Spiritual. Remember in John, faith cometh by hearing. It comes by knowledge. It doesn't come by feeling. I don't know if I'm saved. Read the book. You'll know. Did you do that? Yes. Amen. I'm very easy about it. I just turn around and I say to you things like this. Uh, do you, did you take Christ as you said? Yeah. I'm you say. Isn't that really easy? Okay. Uh, do, are you trusting on uh, the, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ? That's a gospel. Are you trusting on that and that alone? Yes. Amen. Way to go. And now you read your book and you keep your assurance because it's not going to give you a feeling. You're, you're going to have to know these things. That's why he says, these things I have written that you may know. That you may know. It's going to be by hearing. It's going to be by knowledge in all those ways and understanding, not by feelings. And he says, these guys are teaching that stuff and they're, they're getting you all pumped up on emotion here. It becomes a flesh fest with it. And God wants you to understand something. All these people, they're not getting away with it. And there's where he starts to talk about these different people. And one of them is, he look at verse number uh, 5 and down to, uh, uh, we're going to go 5 to 7. The Bible says, I will therefore put you in remembrance, though ye once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. And the angels, which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of that great day. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them, in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, he says, are set forth an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Father, thank you. We ask you, Lord, to bless this 
preaching, Lord Father, and, and if you would, Lord, get into our hearts. We, we need these things. We're going to get a, a big teaching, but Lord, uh, uh, let some of it get in uh, that I may understand what you're trying to tell me spiritually. I thank you, Lord. love you. Just give us some fresh oil in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, now. The first page of that Bible and the first verse, it says, In the beginning God created what? The heaven, singular, right? Mm -hmm. And the earth. The heaven and the earth. So we have uh, two elements there, okay? Uh, God says uh, he's, got, he's going to give you, he has a division. He has the heaven and the earth. Now, um, would you say heaven spiritual or physical? It's spiritual, okay? Heaven is a spiritual location, okay? Yes, we have space available, but uh, he has a different look at it. Now, you have something that looks like this. They're spiritual, and what do you think the next one is? Physical, okay? Spiritual, can, you can't touch it. You can't feel it. Words are spiritual, Okay? Jesus said these words are spirit. These words are life. He says if I give you these words inside, they fix you all up. Amen. Okay? Uh, physical, he was healing people physically, but what do you think it's better to do? Heal somebody physically or heal somebody spiritually? Spiritually. Spiritually. So the same with the Lord. He had two types of uh, things that have happened. It's always these two different ways. Uh, God is a divider. Well, wait a second. We have need to build bridges. No, we need to build walls. Did you ever notice that in the Bible? God's building walls. Can anybody show me the one bridge he built? It's not. Because there are none. And the reason why is because God's looking. He's not looking for us to go uh, join the world. He wants the world to join us. And when they do, they'll be out of the world. And they won't be a part of that world anymore. Only their physical life is living there. Amen? That's what God's trying to tell you. Uh, God is not, let's get the whole thing together. No, divide it up and get rid of the weeds. That's how God thinks. He wants to divide it up. And that's why he even said to those that are sanctified, what's that? Set apart, separate from the sinners. That's what God wants. That's why you have a church. He gets you in here to do what? To get separated from the world. That's what this, look, you're not citizens of the United States when you come in here. You're citizens of a place called New Jerusalem. When you come in here, They're, look, let them keep their junk outside. Keep it out there. I don't want it in here. They, and they can do their things outside. And when the cops come, so that, that they can sit outside. And if they come in, they can hear about Jesus Christ and how to get saved. Amen. We're a different people that are in here. We're, the, we're a spiritual uh, nation. Amen. A holy nation. God wants us as. And he, he has a definite thing. Now, God, when he started this whole thing out, you're, you should all be at Genesis right now. I'm going to show you something. Look, uh, what I'm going to show you real fast is not something that we're going to argue about, okay? All right, I'm not here to do it. I'm just going to give it to you. Want to talk about it later? Go ahead. I'm not worried about commentaries or what this one says or what that one says. Uh, there are some things in the Bible we have to contend with. Amen? Nobody's trying to uh, bring new theories in or anything else. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Look at the second verse. And the earth was without what? Void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. So what happened? Uh, why would, I mean, did not God, doesn't God, when he does something, doesn't he create everything perfect? I mean, he can't create it with a flaw. How could he create it with a flaw when he's a perfect being? Who creates the flaws? Well, we do. We do. So God created things. Now, what did he create? He created two different beings, two different types of beings. He creates a celestial being, which is angelic. And there's, we only know of three forms. We know of, uh, we know of the cherubims. We know of the seraphim. And we know of the angels, and in the angels there's archangel and angel. Amen? So he has three that we know of. I don't know if there's any more, but he tells me of three. Okay? And then he has another being he had, and that being is what? A man. 
he put a man and then he has all the animals and all the, you know all around these these other beings and they're living on the earth and God does it and you have one being though that is spiritual and the other being is physical you're the being is physical right so what are the angelic beings they are spiritual well, uh, right now we don't see them as much but at times they were different okay so uh, go to uh, Go to Ezekiel chapter 28. I'm going to deal with verse 6 first to get it out of the way so we can uh, we can just go into the next two which are dealing more with uh, how people act. Ezekiel uh, chapter 28. And in Ezekiel chapter 28, uh, we'll go down to where the where the cherub starts. Just give me a few seconds. I'm trying to talk while doing things. So go down to uh, verse number 13. Actually, tw uh, 12. He says, <coughs> "Son of man, son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him." Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom, and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Do you thoroughly believe the king of Tyrus was in the garden of God? I mean, he's talking to Tyrus. But who do you really think he's talking to? He's talking to Satan. It's right inside of him. Amen? Okay, remember with Peter, he says something. He says... Peter, he says, get thee behind me, this Peter, he says, Satan. Well, he's talking to Peter. Why would he, you're working for him right now. You see? So I'm talking to Satan, he said, if you're working for him. So that's, he's talking to Ta the king of Tyrus, uh, but he's talking to Satan that's working in that guy. And this is what he said. He said, thou hast been in the Eden, the garden of God. Now, I don't know about you, but I know a little bit about English. And you know what English says? If it's Eden, the garden of God, the whole area of Eden is the garden. And it's a region and it's the garden of God. But if I turn around and I say the garden of Eden, there is a garden that's inside of Eden. Can you understand that? Okay, uh, I don't know how New Yorkers can understand that. I'll show you why. You have a town of Antwerp or wherever, the town of Philadelphia, the town of... Uh, uh, Lorraine, you have the town of Antwerp. Uh, Governor has a town outside. You have towns, and then inside the towns you have these little, little communities, and they call them villages. So you have the town, which is called Antwerp, and inside you have a village, and that's the village of Antwerp. You have the garden, Eden, the garden of God, which would be the whole town of Antwerp, or you could have the garden that's in Antwerp. Can you understand that? Okay, there are two different gardens. That's what I'm trying to tell you. There was two different, there was two different societies. There are two different. I, I don't know what we should call them, civilizations. What's that? Well, God created their angels first, the angelic beings, and then He gave them a, a realm and dominion. Okay. Now watch what this says. In Ezekiel 28, it says uh, verse number, uh, verse number 14 goes through all the area of in 13 about what he was. Now watch, he says, thou art the anointed, what, cherub that covereth. Okay, so he's a different being, he's an angelic being, he's a cherub. And he says, I have set thee so, thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Verse 15, thou Lucifer was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created till iniquity was found in thee. I would assume that iniquity was found pretty fast. I would assume that even in Adam there was iniquity that was found right in the back, right in the beginning. What's that? Iniquity is something that's inside. And Satan kind of maybe just looked to the side, took his eyes off of God or something like that and started to think something else. Well, you'll notice something in the Bible. God doesn't work, or even the Lord doesn't work on iniquity. He works on the transgression. What's that? Uh, you thought about sinning, 
Everyone here thought about sinning before you sinned. Even, remember Moses, when uh, the Egyptian taskmaster was out there beating the guy? What did it say of Moses? He looked this way and that way, and then he went down there and killed that guy. Just so you know, that's murder one. He thought about it, and he had intent to go down there. Okay, so God does say murderers like that, murder one, so don't think he does it. Well, uh, he had iniquity first, and then it came out the transgression. Okay? Uh, anybody here ever get punched in the arm or something like that? Get this big bruise? <coughs> it doesn't bleed, does it? It's on the inside. You are bleeding on the inside. That is a look at iniquity. Uh, in Isaiah chapter 53, uh, verse number 5, it says, He was wounded for our transgressions. Transgressions, wounds. Wounds are on the outside. Okay? They're cuts. They open up. He was wounded. He was cut open on the outside for our transgressions. Transgressions are on the outside. There are the shoplifting, a shoplifting, the actual taking. That's the transgression. Amen? The iniquities, those thoughts you have in you. He was bruised for our iniquity. What's that? The inside stuff. Amen? It's both bad, but God works on the, uh, on the transgression. Go to Isaiah 14. Isaiah 14. Now, Isaiah 14 is the uh, fall of Lucifer uh, to Satan. And it will start in verse number 12 right here. Uh, just so you know, you have the only book that, that identifies... Uh, who he actually is. It says, How art thou fallen from heaven? Who? O Lucifer, son of the what? Morning. Not the morning star, people. The morning star is who? I'd, I'd be worried about a book that said he was the morning star, that Satan's the morning star, because that's a title that's given to Jesus Christ. Amen? And he says, he says, How art thou cut down to the ground, uh, which did weaken the nations? Verse number 13, For thou hast said where? In thine heart. Lisa, that's iniquity, right? You just thought about it. You said it here. Okay, so it's right there. This is where uh, God sees it. He says iniquity was found in him. That's the iniquity right there. He says what? He says, I will ascend into heaven. Now, if God created the heaven and the earth and he's going to ascend into heaven, where is he? There's only one other place. He's on the earth. He had to be created after that sentence, first of all, because in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. He couldn't ascend into heaven if he wasn't, if wasn't already created. Amen? So he says, he says, I will ascend into, the hev into heaven. Uh, look at the next one. I will exalt my what? Uh, do you realize what he just said? He has a kingdom here. He has some type of dominion. He had a throne. You don't just have a throne and, and you just talk to nobody. I even have a pulpit and I talk to people. Uh, if people aren't here, I don't talk to anybody. Amen? Except my wife. She sits there. But anyway, he says, now look at the next one. He says, I'm going to exalt my throne where? Above the stars of God. He had a throne and he had some beings in that throne that he was in charge of. Now watch, it says, he, look at the next part. Here's where it really gets touchy. I will sit. Now look at the next word. Also, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Where's that? What, what's in the uh, mount of the congregation in the sides of the north? That's where God sits in the sides <coughs> of the north. So what is he saying? I can sit up, I'm going to sit up there with God. And then look what he says. I will ascend. Look at the next one he says. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. And then he says, I will be like who? I'm going to be like God. I'm going to be just like him. I'm going to sit right next to him. I'll be the fourth person in the Trinity. How's that one? Or maybe he's looking at, well, I can, I can rule too. I'll be just like him and he'll make me a ruler. And what happened was the iniquity that he found in while he was down here uh, was the same iniquity that turned into a transgression, and guess what he did? Let's go get it, guys. Well, how's that? Well, think about it. 
How many days of the week are there? What, do you, what is the seventh day? It's the Sabbath, right? Now, what are you supposed to do on the Sabbath? Worship God. These things of old are the same. They, they probably are on the earth. And he said he went up and down in, in Ezekiel. He went up and down. Uh, what's that mean? He went up and they worshiped God. What happens sooner or later? Well, uh, the next time we go up there, we got a plan. What's that? We'll take over. Go to Isaiah 24. We did this um, Isaiah 24 at nighttime on Sunday. Uh, boy, oh boy, your head starts spinning in that one. Isaiah 24. And the first verse right there. He says, Behold, the Lord maketh the earth empty. He maketh it waste. He turneth it, where? Upside down and scattereth abroad the inhabitants thereof. When did that happen? When did that happen? Kind of odd, isn't it? We would think that. Well, let's think about this. Got the earth. Okay, doesn't look like that. Give me a break. All right? What's at the top? Irish. North Pole, right? Okay, what's at the bottom? Okay, it was turned upside down. Now turn it right back, right side up again. If it's upside down now, guess what? Turn it up, turn it right side up. Just so you know, you're living on an upside down earth right now. You have a heart inside you that's upside down. And it's split and it's divided. It takes God to put all that stuff right side up and, and together. That's why he made it like that for you. So it's upside down. So if we turn it again to right side up, what's up here? Antarctica. Amen. Antarctica would be at the top. Does anybody notice anything about Antarctica? Is it inhabited or is it habited? It's inhabited. It's inhabited. Nobody can live up there without some kind of bubble or something weird like that. Okay, so it's not habitable. All right? It's basically an ice cap. Uh, God said he made the earth to be what? Habited. Okay, uh, now, I don't think Peter knew this, but you ever notice there's guys that write in the Bible and there's no way they could have figured that stuff out be because they didn't understand time and everything else? And, you know, they were just writing for what they had at that time. It seemed right to them. Uh, go to 2 Peter chapter 3. Now, I, I don't think Peter understood uh, all this part, but God gave... Uh, a good look at it because you have to understand something this is a living book it's not dead God didn't just give it out and that's all you got you get messages every day if you want them why it's called inspiration people stop listening to these guys in pulpits that are deadheads the reason why they say these things and they say it has to be this way and this is all it can be this is this and this is that and they go down the line is because God don't speak to them no more and they're trying to use different languages to do it. And I find it all the time. Just go with the book. 2 Peter chapter uh, 3. Now look, like I said, you don't have to believe this. This is okay. It's not going to uh, make it. There's no way to split from everybody. But uh, God says something. He says, he says there, he says, uh, verse number 5. He says, for they, they willingly, our fathers, that felt, they fell asleep. They lost their uh, uh, insight to things. And, uh, and, and everything keeps going on since the beginning of creation. And he says, for this, they are willingly are ignorant. What's that mean? They just want to be stupid. They want to be. Isn't that what he would say, Timmy? They're willingly ignorant. They want to be stupid. Amen. They're still there. And he says that by the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. Now, if you have the earth, and the earth is a planet, and the earth is standing, now it's a planet, in and out of the water, like a buff fish bobber, okay? The water, it's standing in and out of the water, okay? And what happened? It got overflowed. Well, how it got overflowed? Isaiah 24. 
and now you're sitting on an upside down earth. What happened to it? What would, if you were here, where would you be now? You'd be underneath the water. Could you imagine a tsunami and everything else that would be coming? You think anybody could have survived? Well, that's what he did with his angels. They were here. This is Eden, the garden of God right there. They went up for their Sabbath, whatever, and sooner or later, guess what happened? He got, he turned around, they tried to take over, and what does it say? Go back to, uh, go back to, um, uh, uh, go back to, excuse me, he turns them over, and, uh, and then he, he washes them out. Go to 2 Peter chapter 3, he says, whereby uh, the world that was then being overflowed with water, what happened? It perished. And then what did God do? Okay, go to uh, Job uh, chapter 26. God's trying to explain this to us, but you have to understand something. We're not the smartest beings in the world. We get a, it takes us a long time to catch up with the Lord. And just so you know, this time that they reigned was not a long time. The lesser being gets more time. Are we not lesser than the angels? We get 6,000 years. They got about 2,000. Remember, there's seven days in the week, and if Christ would have came back without the church, that would have been he would have been uh, caught with 2,000 years. What could he have done? Well, he could have showed the first one. What's that, 2,000 years? They, they messed up, took them 2,000 years, and God got rid of them. Okay? Now, he says uh, in Job, in Job chapter uh, 26, look down at uh, verse number uh, 6. He says, Hell is naked before him, and destruction hath no covering. Verse number 7, He stretcheth out the north. And he says, Over what? The empty place. And he hangeth the earth on what? Upon nothing. So what he's trying to tell you is there's a he, he has an empty place out there, and what he does is in this empty place he puts the earth in there, and now the earth is hanging on what? It's not supported. It's just there. It's just hanging. God's holding it right there, and when he's done with it, guess what? It's not. It's going to fall, and he tells about that when he says the transgression upon it later on in, in 24 of Isaiah, it's going to fall away. He has an empty place. What do you mean he has an empty place? Go to the first page of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1. He explains this. He drowned those people out, those, that first civilization. They had their shot, and now he's going to work with somebody else. The first page of the Bible. And you'll notice it says it's uh, uh, the first day gets complete when he made light. There's, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light that it was good. And he divided the light from the darkness. Verse number 5. And called the, the light day and the darkness night. He didn't have the sun yet. Uh, and the evening and the, mor and the morning were the first day. Verse 6. And God said, watch, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made uh, the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. Verse number eight. And God called the firmament what? heaven. So what do we got here? Well, we were like this, and there was water throughout all the universe, except for where that is and where God's throne was. God pushed it down into the water. Obviously, would have had to push it into the water, and now you got this. And God took what's called a firmament, an empty place, and he put it in the midst of that water, and now you're living basically in a big old beach ball, basically, with the earth in the middle of it. Anybody here ever play that top that you pushed and it spun around and all those things were going erratically around it? Did you ever notice in the middle there's one little marble and it's just hovering there? How is it doing that? Well, by science, everything is moving around it, keeping it in place. That's what our universe is. 
Everything's spinning around, and it's keeping the earth in place. You say, well, no, the sun is the middle. Whoever told you that one? People in school? You read the Bible, he tells you differently. He tells you something else. He tells you the sun goes around the earth. He doesn't tell you the sun, the earth goes around the sun. And I want you to understand this. I went to the high levels of college. They have still yet to prove that the earth revolves around the sun. Yet to prove. I'll be waiting for anybody to come with any type of scientific experiment to show me different. But I'll tell you the experiment you can do. Take a telescope and fill it with water. Look at the sun. See where the light, you ever go into a pool and you go down to the bottom and you see the light coming through? The rays? Okay, if you do that with a telescope, what's going to happen is, if the earth is moving, now think about this, if the earth is moving and the sun is not, the light that comes in will always go straight down into your eye. But if the sun is moving and the earth is steady, what will happen is the ray that comes in will go to the side. What do you think it does? It goes to the side. Now, I gave you a lot of meat in that passage, just so you know, and told you a little bit of meat there. But I'm going to tell you, God says a little bit better than I could ever do. Okay? Uh, does anybody remember Joshua? Go to Joshua chapter 10. <coughs> See, I, I had this thing called uh, education too in school. Yeah, they lied, they lied a lot to me. Joshua, chapter 10. Then we're going to have to go on because i got to get two more sections done. This one I just wanted to get, I wanted to under, let you understand. There were two civilizations. And they were not far apart. It's a young earth, people. Joshua, uh, chapter uh, 10. And what happens, they're in a great battle. And, uh, and Joshua... Uh, turns around, he sees that uh, things uh, he needs to he needs to get the Lord involved in this. And Joshua turns around and he he uh, oh man Joshua makes a statement here uh, and he says in verse number um, Joshua said the Lord of David it up verse number twelve. Then spake Joshua in this battle, it spake to the Lord in that day, in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel, and he said in the sight of Israel, Son, he's talking to the son, he says what? Stand thou still upon Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of Ajalon. Okay, so now that it means nothing because God's recording that Joshua is saying this. But look at the next verse, this is the Holy Ghost speaking. And in the next next verse, it says, And the sun stood what? Did it say the earth stood still? No, it says the sun stood still. Who's explaining this? Oh, well, it's Joshua. No, this is the Lord explaining it. And he says, And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed, until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. And it's written in a book. Why? Wow, God wanted to record this book. The book, this guy, Jasher, wrote part of the Bible, and that's who wrote this right here. That this, this did it. And he puts it in there. You say, well, I don't believe it. Do you believe Hezekiah? Do you remember Hezekiah did something? He asked for more years from God. And then what did, uh, what did he say? He said, I'm going to give you a sign. What's that? He says, the sun is going to move back. How many? Ten degrees. And the sun moved back 10 degrees. He didn't say he moved to stop the earth or anything like that. He said he, moved, he was going to move the sun. Uh, it goes like this. Who do you believe, God or your professor at the university? God was there. I don't believe anything they say, just so you know. They weren't their creation. They know nothing about it. They got some weird thing happening, and then they turn around and tell you it's faith. They don't even know how it happened. They sit there and say there's this huge blow-up thing or whatever, and uh, that's about as good as you could come up with. And that, what's that? I, I could come up with one. God blew up balloons and they made things out of them. Oh, that's a good one too. That's about as good as what they have. Uh, look, when my daughter went to school, uh, they told her she came out of monkeys. 
Now, when my daughter came to me and said that, I turned around and said, did your teacher say you came from a monkey? She said, yes. I said, next time your teacher asked that, ask, ask her how many monkeys she has in her family because we don't see any. People have people, monkeys have monkeys. They don't become human beings, they're still monkeys. Okay? That's how it works. The only difference we have is once we're here, we can make variables. How? Well, Larry and Mary, they got together, they have two different DNA, and they made another kid, and guess what? Half that kid looks like her, and half that kid has him, and they have different features. You understand? And then the next one will have a different feature from the next man, and that's how it works. Amen? They don't turn into a, a they don't, the person doesn't turn into a, a bird or something like that and start flying around. What's that mean? God knows exactly what he's doing. Amen? Now, we got this part. I'm going to have to go on because this is where it makes it. Looking at verse number 6 in Jude. And he says, the angels, just like Satan, who didn't keep their first estate, they didn't want to serve God. They wanted to move on. Uh, they wanted to rebel. They decided to rebel. You know what? God washed them out. And, uh, and he says right here, he says, but the angels that kept not their first estate, they didn't want to. They didn't want to keep this. Uh, he says that they left their own habitation. They, they were the ones that rejected God. And he says what? He says uh, they, they reserved in everlasting chains under darkness uh, unto the judgment of that great day. They're going to be judged someday, and, and God's going to do it. Now go to, uh, he, he puts this a little different in another verse, and go to 2 Peter chapter 2. Second Peter chapter 2. And you'll notice in chapter 2, he's talking about the same thing Judas dealing with, uh, but there were false prophets, false teachers, okay? And, uh, and he brings this up, he tells you about uh, the way of truth, and then look, in verse number 4, he says, look, he says, and for if God spared not the angels that did what? That did sin. They sinned in that first creation, or that first uh, uh, civilization. He said what? He cast them down to hell. So he threw them out. Now you'll notice one thing. Is Satan in hell? He was cast down, but he's not in hell yet. He's going to be there during the millennium. He cast them down to hell, but guess where they, they ended up? Well, when Jesus was on the earth, who was bothering him? A bunch of unclean spirits and devils. They got washed out up there. They lost their body. He maketh his angel spirits ministers of a flame of fire. What's that? They don't have bodies now. They left them. They left their first estate. That's their not just their habitation. Your state is your body too, not just your location. You ever see somebody when they pass away? Their house goes up for sale, doesn't it? Amen. They lost their estate. All of it. Your 401ks, everything becomes part of that estate. Uh, they lost their first estate, and they got cast down uh, into, down to hell, and they're on the earth, and someday, you know, God's going to turn around and put them there. Uh, when? Uh, we all read Matthew 25, right? What happens in verse number, in the 40 verses? In 31, it says that depart from me, be cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for who? The devil and his angels. They're not there yet. A whole bunch of people down there. But guess what? They're going to they're gonna see real soon who's coming with them for about a thousand years. They're a little bigger than those people, so guess who's in charge? Amen. That's why I wouldn't want to go to hell. I don't want no angel with me. They're bigger than me. Amen. So here's where you've got a, a difference. Now, he says they're in everlasting chains of darkness. So the first thing you thought was physical. You thought physical. You said, well, God's got a chain there, and he, he's going to wrap them around them. Um, everlasting chains of darkness. The chains are darkness. So you've got, a, you've got a physical there, and you've got a spiritual. He cast them down. But what else did he do? Spiritually, he put them in everlasting chains of darkness. What's that? Uh, I'll show you. I'll show you real fast. Go to... Um, Let's go to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter uh, chapter 2. 
1 Corinthians chapter 2. Okay, in chapter uh, 2, uh, looking at verse number, uh, verse number 7, he says, But we speak the wisdom of God, how? In a mystery. Even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which, watch, when none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So uh, one person could think that if they didn't know he was Christ, they wouldn't have killed him. Amen? If they didn't know who it was, they wouldn't have killed him. Now I want you to understand this. He already told them who he was. He made the miracles. What were they yelling on that, that day of Thursday? They weren't yelling, uh, okay, uh, let him live. They were yelling, crucify him. Now that is, go to, go to, uh, go to Galatians chapter 3. I want you to see it for yourself. Galatians chapter 3, which is a, a regurgitating a verse that is in Deuteronomy. Now you'll notice a phrase in chapter uh, 3. Look at verse number 13. And that phrase is, Cursed is every man that does what? Hangeth on a tree. Jesus hung on a tree, amen? It was a cross. He hung on it. It was made of wood. He hung on a tree. So cursed is a man that hangs on a tree. There was only one way God, God could kill his own son. And that was crucifixion. He had to, had to hang him on a tree. What were they yelling? Crucify him. What's the problem? They didn't have a spiritual insight, and even the devil was pushing this. Crucify him, crucify him. If the devil would have known that spiritual implication of he only had to be crucified, had to be on a tree, he would have been yelling, yeah, stone him. Kill him some other way. Stone him. Beat him to death. He could only be killed on the tree, and he didn't know it. Why? He doesn't have to understand something. Is not the devil a spirit? Are not the angels spirits? Are they God's spirit? So they don't have the spiritual look at the Bible and the scriptures as you do. They have another spirit. So they could memorize this whole book and they won't find those things. That's what you have to understand. You have God's spirit and through inspiration you learn these things, the hidden things. That's why God calls them what? This is a mystery. They don't know, and you're not going to know unless you have the Spirit of God. And what's God say? Unless somebody, like I send somebody to do what? Teach you of these things. Just say, you know, that's what I'm supposed to do. I teach you of these things. Okay? And that's what a pastor should do. He should be teaching his flock. Because guess what? You're going to meet God, and you need to know who he is. Amen? So that's what he's saying. He didn't, doesn't have a spiritual uh, look. So... Go back to uh, uh, Jude. <coughs> Everlasting chains of darkness. What's that? The darkness is spiritual darkness. He's not. He doesn't know any of this stuff. He used to know, but now he doesn't. He doesn't understand any of that stuff. And sooner or later, somebody's going to grab a chain and they're going to put him in hell for a thousand years and they're going to let him go after the end of the millennium and guess what's going to happen? He's going to mess up the everything again and then God's going to put him, put him down again for good. And that's it. Then they're going to push him all the lake of fire, all those entities. And they're gone. So what he's saying is, if God, now these guys, these, these angels, they, they saw it. They saw the throne of God. And they knew these things. They knew better than we did. They saw it. They, could, they knew how to worship God right there. They were doing it in his presence in their spirit. And guess what? God said, that's it. You don't have that no more. They can't worship God. How? In spirit and truth. Didn't you notice when Jesus showed up, what did they say? Are you here to get rid of kill us? 
Well, if they knew the spiritual applications of the Bible, they'd know that it wasn't going to happen until later, wouldn't they? They were afraid right there. They don't know these spiritual things. Why? They're, they'll never know. They're in everlasting chains of, dark, of darkness. They're not going to know these things like you do. That's what he's talking about there. One's physical, cast them down, and then the next one is spiritually. They don't, they, they, they're, they don't have it. They're not spiritually discerned. They can't figure this stuff out. Just like when you go and talk to your unsaved friends, and you, or, or even your friends that are saved but don't read the Bible and don't, aren't taught the Bible, and you try and teach them a communion or anything like that, what is it? You're, they're not spiritually discerned. They're sitting there going, and you're trying to explain it. And they don't want to hear it. The problem isn't that it's not true. The problem is they're not spiritually discerned. They can't figure this stuff out. They don't have anybody teaching them that stuff, and some guy's teaching them sensational stuff. Now, let's look at verse number 5 back in Jude. Now he says, remember, they're not spiritually discerned, and he brings this up and he says, I will, I will therefore put you in remembrance of what? Though you once knew this, how that the Lord having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, brought them out after the Passover, what happened? He afterwards destroyed them that believed not. There were some that went out and they didn't believe. What's that mean? Everybody comes out as a Hebrew, amen? Everybody that came out, bring them out. We had some mixed multitude, but guess what? They wanted to be Hebrews. Well, they all come out there, but you have to understand something. Not everybody believed, did they? Some people weren't saved, were they? Just like today. You can have, all, see all these people? We, you can have a church of 200. Uh, what if there's one person saved and the rapture happens? Does that person go up? No, they're still sitting there. But they're in the church. No, 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 they're not in the church. See, the whole church went up. See, the problem you have is they call themselves Christians, but not all Christians are saved by what the world says. Amen? You got a whole bunch of people down the road, down and down the statues. They're not saved, and guess what? They're not saved. They know not God. They know not the Lord. So what's God saying? We walked across the desert. Some people got on our side. Some people weren't. Those ones that started stuff, they tried to make their own little uh, uh, tabernacle with Korah, and they had to bring in the, uh, all the rods of the censers, and the member of rods, uh, Aaron's rod budded. It, it gave out free things. It gave out buds. It gave out blossoms. It gave out almonds. Just so you know, that's your spiritual outlook. You're either a bud and you're, you're a little child, or you're a blossom and you're a young man, or you're a, a, an almond, which is the best fruit, and that's a father of faith. That's what he's showing you there. It, 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 underneath that tabernacle, <coughs> uh, the real priest, he's going to have all kinds of, man of God's going to have uh, those three things. And that's what he's trying to show you. Not everybody that left, not all Israel is Israel. There's an Israel of the flesh and an Israel of the faith. He says, of, of Abraham, you came to the flesh. But my seed shall be called in Isaac. What's he trying to say? Those who are saved that have the knowledge of God and know who he is. They're the ones in the end. So at the very end, now Israel has the first rebirth, which was in 1948, and they became a, 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 a nation, physical nation. Well, guess what? Uh, they're, not a, they're not a spiritual nation yet, are they? When does that happen? Uh, that happens in Zechariah. When he comes in, he says, what are these, thy wounds in the, hand of the hands and the feet? What's that day? The day of atonement is the day when they come to Christ in the middle of the tribulation. He makes an appearance. But guess who? Uh, not everybody's going to get saved, and, and he's going to take his people, put them away. But what's going to happen to those other people? They go through it. And guess what? They die just like everybody else, amen? Not all Israel is Israel, people. We have a habit of looking towards Israel and, oh, leave them alone. Let God handle them, okay? He knows exactly what he's doing. Amen. Now we have another group here. Look at verse number Jude. Look at verse number 7. Got about five, seven minutes left. Now this one is even Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh are set forth for an example of suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. You think you think these sodomites out here doing these pride parades, you, you think that God's not watching this? 
They're sitting right in front of him. He has to actually look at this thing. And there's men on top of floats doing all kinds of crazy sexual acts, thinking that children should be watching these things. I've got to tell you something. These people are mentally insane. They are insane, and they're coming after our kids. And you know what the, do you know what our public is doing? Yay! They're really smart people. This is the exact, this is the best we came up with, people. After all these years, this is the best we came up with. What's that? A man's trying to be a girl. What a society we've come up with. You know, really that good. And you don't think God's looking at this? And you don't think that God's not going to judge this sooner or later? Okay, it's coming, people. Why? He tells you, he says, look at Sodom and Gomorrah. What's that? that they willingly were Sodomites. Willingly. Did you know what they said? They, they, he sent angels down there. He sent angels. You know, they, they could have, they would have ran up. Hey, what do you know about God? Talk to me. No, no, they didn't want to do that. You know what they wanted to do? It says they wanted to know him. What's no? Adam knew his wife. Don't you get it? It says it later in Judges 19. Again, it happens. What happened? The men wanted to go with the men. This is sickness. This is crazy. You know what? And God turns around and says, what? Just for, hey, look, I'm going to rain down fire and brimstone. And he starts sending it down. And guess what? They got pushed 1,800 feet below sea level. Where's that? Up uh, the Dead Sea. Where's Sodom and Gomorrah? It's underneath of it. That's what God does when, he, when he's had enough and he starts to send down fire and brimstone. Guess what happens? You go really far down. Does anybody here realize that, uh, that the Dead Sea is the lowest part on the earth? On land? It's 1,800 feet below sea level. Nothing there can live. And it's full of brimstone, sulfur, and salt. And when they dig down, you know what they started to find? They started to find pellets like this. God rained down fire and brimstone and hail. You don't play with him when he's upset. Amen? That's how he deals with wickedness. Well, why isn't he doing this? Don't worry. He's got this whole thing figured out. Look, here's your biggest problem. The church has been around for 2,000 years. Amen? Okay? Was the United States been around for 2,000 years? No, but you're in it and you think it should be. God put a nation up and put a nation down. The Romans were up. Now they're down. Guess what? Another one come up and they're down. This is just another civilization that's been up and up and up. And guess what? It's coming to an end. You're not going to turn around and kill little children. And you're not going to turn around and act like that. And God not turn around and judge you. Amen? And that's why he deals with Sodom and Gomorrah like that. What's that? You think they're going to get away with it? If someday when we're out of here and the, the rapture's gone and they're uncovered, that veil that was on Moses' face, guess what? That veil is going to, is, is their, their discernment that they can't pick up anything, uh, anything spiritually. But guess what? God's going to send there physically. You wanted it? You got it now. You don't want me? You're going to get what I give you. Amen? And you're not going to live on this earth the way you want to. You're going to live on the earth the way I want to, God said. And when you don't, I'll kick you off. That's how it's going to come down in the very end. So you're waiting for this, and you're saying, God's late. No, 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 he's right on time. He knows exactly. He's giving them a chance to do what? The same thing he's doing for you. Amen. God wants repentance out of all of us before we get to see him. And I tell everybody, do it. Do it. He gives you all sorts of time, and then finally he says, that's it. And that's it. That's it. Okay, go back into the book. I got three minutes. We went over most of these. Now, here's the big one, and I want to just dispel this thing. There is, uh, just so you know, there is no such thing as the book of Enoch. Okay, and I'll tell you why there's none. What was it written in? They'll tell you Hebrew. There wasn't a Hebrew around in the time of Enoch. There was no Hebrew. Hebrew didn't come around until there was a guy by the name of Abraham. There was Eber, but then Abraham is the first Hebrew. There wasn't Hebrew at that time. What's that tell you? They weren't speaking that. There was, uh, in fact, there is, no, there is no Hebrew or anything or any distinction until after Genesis chapter 11 when he split everybody up and sent them on their way. Before that, they were one language and of one people. There was no separate language. 
There was no Hebrew. And just so you know, there, there is no recorded history before the flood. None whatsoever. He drowned everything out. Can't you give God a little credit? And it's, you know what the biggest problem is? You've got a bunch of preachers out there. And you know what they say? Well, Moses, well, Noah, he took these tablets on the ark. Are you, you're sick in the head, right? There was no written or recorded history until, uh, until Moses writ, wrote it. Amen? Why? Well, let's look at the book. Go to Genesis chapter uh, 5. Genesis chapter 5. I like how God uses uh, the fifth chapter to do this because you'd have to read the first four. Look at the first verse. And what does it say? This is what? The book. This is the book of the generations of who? Adam. In the day that God created man in the likeness of God, made he him. This book right here, Moses is the first one who puts down the genealogy of Adam. It was not Noah. He did not have any tabs on the boat. Uh, God showed Moses, and he showed him when he was in the cleft of the rock, where everybody tries to say he saw his hinder parts, which is not in the Bible. It says he saw his back Parts. What's that? I'm going to show you my goodness, is what God said. Moses, I'm going to show you the goodness of God. He said, show me thy glory. He says, I'll have all the goodness passed before, your, uh, before you. What goodness? Go to Psalm 33. This is the goodness. You like learning the Bible? Amen. It's good stuff, man. I've got thrown out a lot tonight. I've got a lot of meat here. Okay? Grasp a few of them. You don't have to grasp it all. This is extra credit. Look at verse number five. He loveth righteousness and judgment. The earth is full of the what? Goodness of the Lord. Now look at the next one. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made. Oh, he's talking about creation. He showed him creation. He went back and gave him Genesis, and he showed him his goodness. Had all his goodness passed by him. How could he have gotten those details that he got in Genesis? There's no way. Whisper down the lane, wouldn't have made it. He had to tell him all these things. And he showed him from the creation, the whole thing that was there. And he took him through it, and then he writes it all. And then he puts it out to the people. How other could he have done it? That's how he showed him. He showed him his back parts. And he showed him the creation in Genesis. And he was able to go through it. Uh, just so you know, in, uh, he saw the first day. And what did he say it was? Good. And he said it was, later on, he said it was very good. And he said it was good. And so the whole creation, it was good. What are you talking about? The goodness of God. Isn't that cool? Uh, just so you know, the, the last author did the same thing. He went ahead in time, and that's why those two people are separated and put apart. The first author of the Bible, he went to the past. The second author, the last author of the Bible, he went into the future. You see? God, God works. And just so you know, they all, both of them wrote five books. One guy wrote the law of death and would kill you. The second one wrote the grace of God. Amen? And the Bible says, the law cometh by Moses, but... Grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. There's a lot of difference there. You see, it's so simple in the Bible. I gave you a lot of meat today, right? Like I said, this is extra credit. It ain't going to get anybody saved or anything like that. It was just for you to understand mysteries that are out there that you just didn't know. And now it starts to all form in. What's that? Because nobody ever says, when did Satan fall? I never hear it. Why? Because they don't know. One civilization, another civilization, God sits there and he says, I've got two civilizations, here's what I want. I want you to choose me and your civilization, worry about that, that God turn around and send his son. What's that? That's what the whole verse lines up on. Uh, John chapter 3, verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever chooses him, 
believeth on him <coughs> shall not perish but have everlasting life. You know, and you've got to understand something. God never told you to understand it. He just told you all these. Amen? And if you don't think God can do all these things, move sons and all that stuff, guess what? You've got the wrong God. He can do anything. He told you that. Jesus came to earth. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for I've done all... I've, 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 I'm here now. And what they do? Let's throw them off a cliff. And if he came back today, you know what? It would be the church that throws them off the cliff. It tries to. Because we've left the Word of God to the commandments and traditions of men. And that's why he's got to pull the church out of here. We are definitely confused people. Amen? Let's pray. Our Father, thank you, Lord God, for the preaching this afternoon. And thank you, Lord, for talking to our hearts, Lord Father. I thank you, Lord, for a good group of sheep. And these are your people, Lord, saved, Lord Father. And, and now they're learning things to, to go out and uh, apply those things to their heart, knowing these things. What, ought to, what, what type of man we should act like out there in our conversation and knowing all these things. We need to act a little better and, and speak to people of, of the things of the Lord, the easy things, that Christ is there and He loves you and He wants, to, he wants you to be with Him and you need to turn your heart to Him uh, by believing that He died for you and He resurrected for you and trust Him on that. Father, we thank You, Lord, for being kind to us today. We thank You for beating on our hearts today and, and stirring our knowledge. We love You, Lord, and want to serve You. Let us come back tonight learn of Jeremiah in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, get out. Hey, hi, Janice. Good to see you. Maggie. It's good to see you, girls. Hoorah.